Good morning. Kali Mehta. <laughs> if you're new here among us, my name is Gene and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. If you are tuning in from somewhere else, welcome to Somewhere Else. Do you have a favorite song? As I ask that question, I bet you can hear it in your mind. And even if you're not a musician, I bet you'd know if someone was covering it. In other words, someone other than the original artist or your favorite artist, if they did the song, you'd notice a difference in the voice, perhaps. Even if you're not a musician, you might even notice if they did a few notes a little bit differently, wouldn't you? You definitely notice if they played a bad note. Those of you who know me well, you know that I used to be a professional musician. I do these because it's kind of like an oxymoron when you think about it. It's like this. You take $5,000 worth of gear, musical equipment, put it in a $500 car, go to a gig to make 50 bucks. So, you get a job at a music store so that you can buy more gear. And that's how it works. Now, working in a music store is an annoying job for a few reasons. I'll give you two of them this morning. One, you must understand that you are not really selling musical equipment. Those guitars on the wall are lotto tickets. Everyone coming in there thinks that if I buy this guitar, I buy the right one, I'm going to get rich and famous once I learn how to play it. <laughs> Not realizing that all of the people working at the music store had that idea one day, too. <laughs> They're all very good. The other annoying thing is that people, when they try out the instruments, especially the guitars, they like to try to show off. Right, so there's something in their minds, like they're thinking, well, someone's going to notice at the music store, they're going to tell a record company guy about me, and I'll get signed. Like as if we didn't have that idea before we started working at the music store. And the other thing is this, if I'm being really honest with you today, most of the people trying out the instruments are not very good. <laughs> One guy in particular comes to mind. I called him the almost guy. Because he would get the song almost right, like this. Right? Every time. It was amazing. And I'd have to force myself not to laugh. It's really funny. But one day, I noticed my colleagues working at the music store laughing. I thought, it's not a really good way to sell guitars, guys. But I looked more closely, and I noticed something. They weren't laughing at him. They were laughing with him. Turns out <laughs> that this guy was actually a really, really good guitar player. He was just making fun of all the people trying to show off. Kind of interesting. Intentionally playing bad notes. There's an art to it, being really good at being really bad. It's hard to do. Now, I don't play guitar very much anymore told you guys in the past, I'm over the whole being rich and famous. I've met a lot of famous people. I just don't care anymore. So it's not my objective in life. But it is my objective to be a good Bible teacher, to know the Bible really well, to be a good pastor. So I've replaced all that guitar playing time with Bible reading time. And if you're a musician, you know, if you want to be really good, if you want to be a professional, you have to practice many, many hours every day. And just to keep up your chops, you have to keep doing that, even if you think you're good. There's always room to grow. And I've learned it's the same thing with the Bible. So I read and also listen to the Bible many hours every day. It's kind of like the music. The better I know it, the more mistakes I catch. 
The better I know the Bible, the more bad notes I hear. And consequently, if I'm being very honest with you today, the more I'm in the Word, the less preaching I like. Because it doesn't always sound like the Bible. In modern times, especially here in America, there are too many pastors just read you a little bit of Scripture and then give you a whole lot of opinions. Do you know, I just learned this, that we have gotten so far off message here in America that there are mission organizations in other countries that send people here because we've got it so wrong. I just learned this at a Bible study. It blew my mind. But when I thought about it, it made sense, right? When you read the Bible and you hear what people are typically saying on a Sunday morning. Typical American sermons are meant to make people feel good, regardless of the state they're in, regardless of their sin. But that's not what the Bible does, is it? It's more of a motivational speech than a biblical sermon, like we saw in the book of Hebrews. We saw that that preacher pulled no punches, went over some really complicated stuff, and quoted a lot of scriptures, the book of Hebrews. In America, you might get one big idea for a sermon. Keep it simple. Stupid. But the Bible doesn't read like most people preach. So today, you're going to hear preaching like the Bible preaches. Again, in our Hebrew series, in the past we talked about how some of these New Testament books are letters or sermons meant to be read aloud in the church. So, in our desire to be a Bible-believing church, as you know, if you've been here for a while, I use a lot of scriptures anyway, but from time to time, we are going to adopt this practice like they did in the early church. We need more of God's Word and less opinions. So today I'll do the opposite of what most people do when they preach. You're going to hear God's Word, not my opinions. Last week, I talked about coming to Jesus with sobriety. And so today, we're going to hear a very sobering message from Jesus. I talked about chapter and verse numbers in the Bible. They weren't there in these original books or letters of the Bible. And as great as they are for reference, they can sometimes act as an interruption. I told you in Hebrews, there are really awkward chapter breaks. Why did they put that chapter there? Sometimes it didn't make sense. So, for example, in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, that is just one continuous flow of Jesus talking. It's a sermon. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And if you listen to it, you'll get to the end of chapter 5. And then there's going to be like this really awkward chapter break, like as if Jesus is getting a glass of water or something. And then it'll say, chapter 6, judging others. That's not there in the sermon. Imagine that, if I had someone just stand up and interrupt me and tell everybody where I was in the middle of my sermon. It might work. I don't know. You might remember it. But anyway, it's an interruption. It sounds like the narrator's interrupting Jesus. It's really funny. So this will be Matthew chapters 5 through 7 and some of Luke chapter 6. If you know the Bible well, you know that there's the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain in Luke. And in some places, they're almost completely identical, but there are some differences. So I've put those differences in where it makes sense or where it is in Luke chapter 6. And even as I combine these two sermons, I want you to take note of something. Take note of how long it is or not. <laughs> Again, this is Jesus talking, so please keep that in mind. When I say I, I mean Jesus. I did not come here to fulfill the law. <laughs> this is how Jesus preached. 
God blesses those who are poor in spirit and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will receive mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all kinds of evil things about you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. What sorrow awaits you who are rich? For you have your only happiness now. What sorrow awaits you who are fat and prosperous now? For a time of awful hunger awaits you. What sorrow awaits you who laugh now? For your laughing will turn into mourning and sorrow. What sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds? For their ancestors praise false prophets. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it loses its flavor? Can it be made salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that can't be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. No. You light a lamp and you put it on a stand for everyone in the house to see. In the same way, let your good deeds shine for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until everything is accomplished. So, if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's law and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder, for... If you commit murder, you'll be subject to judgment. But I say, even if you are angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone a fool, you are in danger of being brought to court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. So if you're pre presenting a gift at the altar and you suddenly realize that someone has something against you, go and be reconciled to that person. Leave your gift at the altar. Then afterwards, present your gift at the altar. When you're on your way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge, will hand you over to the officer, and then you'll be thrown into prison. And if this happens, you won't get out till every last penny is paid. You have heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. So, if your eye, even your right eye, causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better for one part of your body to be lost than for your whole body to burn in the fires of hell. 
And if your right hand, even your right hand, causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one part of your body for your whole body to be thrown into hell. You have heard that the law says a man can divorce his wife merely by writing her a certificate of divorce. But I say, a man who divorces his wife, unless she's been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. You've also heard that our ancestors were told, you must not break your vows. You must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. But I say to you, don't make any vows. Don't say by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. And don't say by the earth, because the earth is his footstool. Don't say by Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is the city of the great king. And don't say by my head, because you can't turn one of your hairs white or black. Just simply say yes. I will, or no, I won't. Anything else is from the evil one. You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, don't resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, give him the other cheek. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give him your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven, where he gives sunlight to both the evil and the good he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do as much. If you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even unbelievers do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose your reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and on the streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you, they have received all the reward they'll ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, who love to pray publicly on the street, in the synagogues, where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they'll ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the people from other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words over and over again. Don't be like them. For your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. And when you fast, don't make it obvious like the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled, so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they'll ever get. But when you fast, 
comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you're fasting except your father who knows what you do in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. Don't store up your treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. No one can serve two masters, for you'll hate one and love the other. Be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. That is why I tell you, don't worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable than they? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work for their clothing, yet Solomon, in all his glory, wasn't as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he'll certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Don't judge others, and you won't be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard that will be applied to you. Can one blind person lead another? Won't they both fall into a ditch? Students, are not greater than their master, but the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. And why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a big log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you with that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own? Hypocrite! First, get the log out of your own eye then you'll do well to help your friend with the speck in his. Don't waste what is holy on the unholy. Don't throw pearls to pigs. They'll trample them and then turn on you and attack you. Keep asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep seeking and you'll find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. You parents, if your children ask you for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone? If they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? Do to others whatever you want them to do to you. This is the law and the prophets. You can enter God's kingdom only through a narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and the gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and very difficult, and only a few ever find it.
Beware of false prophets who come in disguised as sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by their actions. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say, Lord, we prophesied in your name. Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We did miracles in your name. But I will say, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Although the rain comes in torrents, the flood waters rise, and the winds beat against it, that house won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains come, the flood waters rise, and the winds beat against it, it will collapse with a mighty crash.